Hello, and welcome to my vlog on animated films, or as we in the Film Knowledge Elite Club call them, cartoons. I'll admit that when it comes to the Minion characters, I can be a little biased. I sat through Despicable Me 1 and 2 in the cinema with barely a giggle. I couldn't understand why these characters are so popular, but they seem to have permeated the consciousness like Pokemon and Furbies in the 90s. They're sort of cute and seem to inject the Despicable Me movies with sight gags and slapstick more akin to the Buster Keaton and Chaplin comedies of the silent cinema era. When elevated to their own spin-off prequel, Origins Movie, the joke wears even thinner, and the weakness of their personality shows bare. The humour is crass and boring, the plotline overly simple, even for a children's film. I know I'm not exactly the target audience, but Illumination has known better with their film Sing only a year later, a much more worthy contender, and enjoyable for both kids and adults alike. Minions took the box office though, so why stop the cash cow? The soundtrack had lots of great songs, but I felt like they didn't quite fit their sequences, or the songs we'd seen before in much better films, and I think they just went with popular songs from the era, oh, it's set in the 60s, did I not mention, over action set pieces. It's about as funny as a burst appendix, and I know which one I'd rather live through again. On the other side of the scale from Minions, however, is Fantasia, a film that tries too hard to be highbrow and almost forgets about its target audience of children. It's classical music over the top of animations. Whilst this could have been a nice way of introducing the under-12s to great tunes, instead the absurdly long runtime and constant interruptions from a composer, Leopold Stokowski, ruin it. The sections with Stokowski overflow with information about what we are about to see, Disney breaking the cardinal film rule of show, don't tell. Many of the cartoon sections are boring, reminding me of the 20 minute colour sequence in 2001 A Space Odyssey, something I'd never subject a child to. The scary final sequence starring popular Disney character Satan as well definitely hits some terrifying notes. The high point is of course The Sorcerer's Apprentice which I think was used in the far shorter and more superior Fantasia 2000, so that might be more worth your time. In my mind, Studio Ghibli is known for being an experimental Japanese animation studio. Ponyo is exactly what I expected, which is why it didn't enthrall as much as I would hope. The storyline was a little confusing, and the villain's aims are unclear. Ponyo is a fish who falls in love with a human boy. Her father and mother are both spirits of the sea with differing amounts of power and wonder how to go about letting her become human. The characters are cute, in particular Ponyo herself, who shines throughout. There are messages of anti-pollution and for the saving of the natural world, which is a staple of Ghibli. Pompoko in particular comes to mind. But here it's only a footnote, and not as important as in some films. The film is good, but maybe I'm not the target audience for the film. I feel as if Ponyo is aimed at the newer Ghibli viewer, or for the very young. Another Disney movie now, with Treasure Planet, and I know why it went under the radar for me. It was released only five months after one of my favourite animations and the far superior, Lilo and Stitch. With a story this classic, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, the Disney team only have to concentrate on the visuals, which to be fair, are stunning. I'm unsure as to whether I like the mix of CGI with hand-drawn animation, and sometimes it does jar. Long John Silver is well cast, and perfectly empathised. His last minute character turnaround though is a little unbelievable and I think that Disney gave the game away a little too early in revealing his ulterior motives, especially to non-fans of the book that are unfamiliar with the character. Again, not to downtrod, but this viewer couldn't help but compare the futuristic retelling with such tongue-in-cheek comedy version Muppets Treasure Island and I thought that when the song I'm Still Here kicked in, I knew that this film was taking itself a little too seriously. Relatively new on the animation scene, Laika's Missing Link is another knockout from the up-and-coming animation studio. I won't get into it here, but really at the 2019 Academy Awards, I Lost My Body should have won, but Toy Story won. I'm not bitter, but... Anyway, Missing Link was also nominated that year, and well deservedly. It was one of three Yeti films, but the animation style here is very unique. I'd like to in particular note the realistic portrayal of light shining through noses and ears as a nice touch. The film stars Hugh Jackman's voice as an intrepid explorer as he sets out to prove that the Sasquatch, or Missing Link as it's commonly referred to throughout, exists. When he finds Susan, the Sasquatch, they then go on a voyage to find Susan's cousins with old friend or flame, Adelina Fortnite in tow. Adelina Fortnite is a little wasted as a character, and Zoe Saldana is wasted playing second fiddle to the two leads. The film only just breaks the Bechdel test, but at least the tables are turned when we think that Adelina may only be there to be Sir Lion or Frost's love interest. 
weirdly and coincidentally, by happenstance, Emma Thompson was both in Treasure Planet and Missing Link. Anyway, the earliest known surviving animation is The Adventures of Prince Ahmed from 1926. It's a German production based on the Arabian Nights Tales. A sorcerer creates a magic wooden horse that Prince Ahmed takes a ride on. He travels to the land of Wak Wak. Along the way, he falls in love with and kidnaps a princess, meets a powerful witch, and runs into Aladdin who helps him fight off some demons. It's a great fairy story, but the only version available is ruined a little by over-narration. I think the title cards were more than exemplary on their own. I doubt some of the story would be made in the modern era, especially the part about the princess falling in love Stockholm Syndrome style with her captor. But the effects are incredible and would stand up in today's entertainment. It actually brought to mind Shadowgraphy, that delighted the Royal Variety performance a few years ago. I found myself wondering how individual shots were made and was particularly impressed by the fight between the sorcerer and the witch that Disney so lovingly ripped off for the Sword and the Stone in 1963. Clearly this is a very influential work, as there's references galore that I now understand in much of Disney's classic works. A beautiful film that should make an ideal Christmas gift to any budding hipster child. Thanks for watching kids, stay in school unless Covid has stopped you from going to school. Be sure to comment, subscribe, rate, as long as it's a thumb up.